This video is made possible by the free-to-play action game Crossout. Check out the game through the link in the description below, and you can start with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin just for registering. During the Cold War, the US government was hell-bent on one-upping the commies in every way possible. In the process, they came up with a number of outlandish plans, such as that one time they proposed nuking the moon, which interestingly enough was a project a young Carl Sagan worked on. There were also many more down-to-earth projects, like the development of what would become the internet, in order to ensure the ease of sharing information among the nation's scientists. This brings us to a project that unfortunately went into history's dustbin. And that was the U.S. Army's plan to build a massive military installation on the moon. Known as Project Horizon, the impetus for the plan came when the Soviets set their sights on the moon. As noted in the Project Horizon report, the Soviet Union in propaganda broadcasts has announced the 50th anniversary of the present government, 1967, will be celebrated by Soviet citizens on the moon. U.S. national space policy intelligence thought this was a little optimistic, but still felt the Soviets could probably do it by 1968. Military brass deems this a potential disaster for the United States for several reasons. To begin with, if the Soviets got to the moon first, they could potentially build their own military base there, which they could use for a variety of secret projects, safely away from the United States' prying eyes. In the extreme, they could potentially launch nuclear attacks on the US with impunity from that moon base. Naturally, a military installation completely out of reach of your enemies both terrified and tantalized military officials. Next up, if the Soviets landed on the moon first, they could claim the entire moon for themselves. If they did that, any move by the US to reach the moon could potentially be considered an aggressive act, effectively making the moon off-limits to the United States unless they were willing to risk war back home. This was seen as a potential disaster because the moon, with its low gravity, was seen as a needed hub for launching deep space missions, as well as a better position to map and observe space than Earth was. Beyond the practical, this would also see the Soviets not just claiming the international prestige of an accomplishment like landing and building a facility on the moon, but also countless other discoveries and advancements after, as they used the moon for scientific discovery and to more easily launch missions beyond it. Of course, the Soviets might do none of these things and allow the US to use the moon as they pleased. But this it wasn't a guarantee. As noted in the Project Horizon report, clearly the US would not be in a position to exercise an option between peaceful and military applications unless we are first. In short, the establishment of the initial lunar outpost is the first definitive step in exercising our options. The threat of having the moon be in Soviet hands simply would not stand. As President Lyndon B. Johnson would famously state in 1964, I do not believe that this generation of Americans is willing to resign itself to going to bed each night by the light of a communist moon. Thus, long before Kennedy would make his famous May the 25th, 1961 declaration before Congress that the US should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth, military brass in the US were dead set on not just stepping foot on the moon, but building a military installation there and sticking around permanently. And so it was that in March of 1959, Chief of Army Ordnance Major General John Henricks was tasked by Chief of Research and Development Lieutenant General Arthur G. Trudeau with developing a detailed plan on what was needed to make such a moon base happen. A strict guideline of the plan was that it had to be realistic, and towards that end, the core elements of the plan had to use components and equipment either already developed or close to being completed. To facilitate the outline for the project, Major General John B. Medaris stated, We grabbed every specialist we could get our hands on in the Army. The resulting report, published on June 9, 1959, went into an incredible amount of detail, right down to how the carbon dioxide would be scrubbed from the air at the base. So, now the question is, well, what did they come up with? To begin with, it was deemed the transport side could be accomplished using nothing more than Saturn I and Saturn II rockets. Specifically, 61 Saturn Is and 88 Saturn IIs would transport around a total of 490,000 pounds of cargo to the moon. An alternative plan was to use these rockets to launch much of the cargo to a space station in high Earth orbit. These larger sections would then be ferried over to the moon using a dedicated ship that would go back and forth from Earth to the moon. The potential advantage here was that for the Saturn rockets to get equipment to the moon, they were limited to about 6,000 pounds per trip 
on average. But if only transporting something to orbit, they could do much greater payloads, meaning fewer rockets were needed. The problem, of course, was that this version of the plan required the development of a ferrying rocket and an orbiting space station, which made it the less desirable option. Again, the strict guideline for the project was that the core of the plan had to use existing or near existing equipment and technology in order to expedite the project and get to the moon before the Soviets. Whichever method was used, once everything was on the moon, a pair of astronauts would be sent to inspect everything and figure out if anything needed to be replaced. The duration of this first moon landing by a man was stated to be a one to three month stay. Next up, whatever replacement items that needed to be sent would be delivered, and then once all of that was set, a construction crew would be sent to complete the base. The general plan there was to use explosives and a specially designed space bulldozer slash backhoe to create trenches to put the pre-built units into. Once in place, they would simply be attached together and buried in order to provide extra protection from meteorites and potential attacks, among other benefits. As for the features of this base, this included redundant nuclear reactors for power, as well as the potential to augment this with solar power for further redundancy. Various scientific laboratories would also be included, as well as a recreation room, hospital unit, housing quarters, and a section made for growing food in a sustainable way. This food would augment frozen and dehydrated food that was being supplied from Earth. This base would also have extensive radio equipment to facilitate the moon functioning as a communications hub for the US military back on Earth that could not be touched by any nation on Earth at the time. On a similar note, it would also function as a relay for deep space communications to and from the Earth. Beyond the core base itself, a moon truck capable of transporting the astronauts and equipment around was also proposed, as well as placing bomb shelters all around the base for astronauts to hide in if needed. Water, oxygen, and hydrogen would ultimately be provided from the ice on the moon itself, not only sustaining the astronauts, but potentially providing any needed fuel for rockets, again to help facilitate missions beyond the moon, as well as transport back home to Earth. Of course, being a military installation, it was deemed necessary for the 12 astronauts that were to be stationed at the base at all times to be able to defend themselves against attack. Thus, for their personal sidearms, a general design for a space gun was presented, more or less being a sort of shotgun modified to work in space and be held and fired by someone in a bulky suit. The astronauts would also be given many Claymore-like devices to be stationed around the base's perimeter or wherever they deemed needed. These could be fired remotely and more or less just sent a hail of buckshot at high speed at wherever they were pointed. Due to the lesser gravity and lack of tangible atmosphere, both of these weapons would have incredible range, if not the greatest accuracy. But really, who needs accuracy when you have nuclear weapons? Yep, the astronauts would also be equipped with those, including the then under development Davy Crockett nuclear gun. Granted, thanks to the lack of atmosphere, the weapon wouldn't be nearly as destructive as it would be on Earth, but the ionizing radiation kill zone was still around 300 to 500 meters. Another huge advantage of the Davy Crockett on the moon was that the range was much greater, reducing the risk to the people who were firing it, and the hull contraption would only weigh a little over 30 to 40 pounds thanks to the moon's lesser gravity, making it easier for the astronauts to cart around than it was on Earth. Of course, this being a space base and everything, Project Horizon's creators naturally included a death ray in its design. This was to be a weapon designed to focus a huge amount of the sun's rays and ionizing radiation onto approaching enemy targets. Alternatively, another death ray concept was to build a device that would shoot ionizing radiation at enemy soldiers or ships. As for spacesuits, according to the project creators, despite being several years before the character would make his debut in the comics, they decided an Iron Man-like suit was absolutely the way to go, rather than a fabric-based outfit as NASA would later choose. To quote the report, for sustained operation on the lunar surface, a body conformation suit having a substantial outer metal surface is considered a necessity for several reasons. One, uncertainty that fabrics and elastomers can sustain sufficient pressure differential without unacceptable leakage. Two, meteorite protection. Three, provides a highly reflective surface. Four, durability against abrasive lunar surface. Five, cleansing and sterilization. It should be borne in mind that while movement and dexterity are severe problems in suit design, 
the earth weight of the suit can be allowed to be relatively substantial. For example, if a man and his lunar suit weigh 300 pounds on Earth, they will only weigh 50 pounds on the moon. Along with death rays, nuclear guns, and badass spacesuits, no self-respecting moon base could be governed by anything as quaint as a simply named committee or the like. Oh no, Project Horizon also proposed creating a unified space command to manage all facets of the base and its operation, along with further exploration in space, including potentially a fleet of spaceships needed to achieve whatever objectives were deemed appropriate once the base was established. As to the cost of the whole project, the report stated, the total cost of the eight and one half year program presented in this study is estimated to be six billion dollars. That's about fifty three billion dollars in 2019. This is an average of approximately seven hundred million dollars per year. These figures are a valid appraisal, and while preliminary, they represent the best estimates of experienced, non commercial agencies of the government. Substantial funding is undeniably required for the establishment of a U.S. lunar outpost. However, the implications of the future importance of such an operation should be compared to the fact that the average annual funding required for Project Horizon would be less than 2% of the current annual defense budget. Of course, the reality is that the entire Apollo program ended up costing a little over $25 billion, so this $6 billion estimate would likely have ballooned to much greater levels had the base actually been built. That said, even massively more expensive given the number of years, this would have still represented a relatively small portion of the United States' annual defense budget, as noted. Sadly, considering the initial plan was explicitly to make this a peaceful installation unless war broke out, meant mostly for scientific discovery, and considering what such a moon base would have meant for the direction of future space exploration, neither President Dwight D. Eisenhower nor the American public had much interest in even going to the moon at all, let alone building a base there. Yep, contrary to popular belief, the greatest generation was pretty unenthusiastic about the whole space thing. In fact, even after Kennedy would make his famous speech before Congress and then at Rice University, a Gallup poll showed almost two-thirds of Americans were against the plan to land a man on the moon, generally seeing it as a waste of taxpayer dollars. Sentiments did not greatly improve from there. But Kennedy was having none of it, as outlined in his September 12, 1962 speech at Rice University. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man, and only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence, can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. As for the US, as the initial glow of the accomplishments of putting a man on the moon rapidly wore off, and with public support almost non-existent for future missions to the moon, it was deemed that taxpayer dollars would be much better spent for more down-to-earth activities, like spending approximately seven times the Apollo program's entire cost, sending older taxpayers' children off to kill and be killed in Vietnam. A slightly less inspiring way to counter the communists. Thus, efforts towards the moon and beyond were mostly curtailed, with what limited funds were available for space activities largely shifted to the space shuttle program and more obviously practical missions closer to home. This is a move that the Soviets quickly copied as well, rather unfortunately. Now, just before we get into the bonus fact for today on a little-known facet of Kennedy's plan for getting a man on the moon, cross out. 
Crossout is an online vehicle action game where all of the vehicles are made by the players. What you basically do is construct your own crazy vehicle from the grounds up with all sorts of different parts. You can add weapons, support systems, a main structure, and you know a whole bunch else to your vehicle, from rail guns to rocket boosters and crazy things like that. Now you might not be able to build a moon base in Crossout, but when it comes to vehicle modification, it's pretty incredible. It's a super fast-paced game with loads of different game modes, and you've got pretty much limitless freedom to create. And what you do with your vehicle is entirely up to you. And it's not complicated right at the start, with there being a very easy learning curve, allowing you to make your own vehicle and get into the game very quickly. There's loads of different game modes as well, so you're sure to find something that you love. So join us on the battlefield for free, by the way, using the link in the description below. And you can do that if you've got a PC, Xbox One, or a PS4. All very easy. Also, going through that link below, it also helps support this show, which is great, but you also get a free starter set with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin, all just as a bonus for registering. Thanks to Crossout for sponsoring, and let's get into that bonus fact. A little talked about facet of Kennedy's goal for landing on the moon was actually to have the Soviets and the US join together in the effort. As Kennedy would state in the aforementioned Rice speech, But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. Unfortunately, each time Kennedy proposed for the US and Soviets to join efforts towards achieving this unifying goal, which seemingly would have seen the Cold War become a lot less hot, the Soviets, they declined. That said, for whatever it's worth, according to Sergei Khrushchev, the son of then-Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, while his father initially thought it was unwise to allow the US such intimate knowledge of their rocket technology, he supposedly eventually changed his mind and had decided to push for accepting Kennedy's proposal. He thought that if the Americans wanted to get our technology and create defenses against it, they would do that anyway. Maybe we could get technology in the bargain that would be better for us. Sergei also claimed that his father also saw the benefit of better relations between the US and the Soviet Union as a way to facilitate a massive cutback in military spending that was a huge drain on Soviet resources. Sergei would further note that Kennedy's assassination stopped plans to accept the offer, and the Johnson administration's similar offer was rejected owing to Khrushchev not trusting or having the same respect for Johnson that he had developed for Kennedy. Whatever the truth of that, thanks to declassified documents after the fall of the Soviet Union, we know that the Soviets were, in fact, originally not just planning to put a human on the moon, but also planning on building a base there as well. This would be called Zvezda, and it was similar to the plan that was outlined in Project Horizon, except instead of digging trenches, the base would simply be placed on the surface and then, if needs be, buried. But if not, the base was to be a large mobile platform to explore the moon. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Crossout. Link below. And as always, thank you for watching.